we have been in this series in First Peter called Sojourners, and uh, last week we talked about this idea of hospitality, about this idea of hospitality that we need to show it to one another. I have the privilege of having grown up, spent part of my life in France. And uh, I learned a lot about French hospitality while I was there. It, it's it, it's kind of particular. They, they have a lot of rules around it. Not rules, but sort of traditions in the way things are done. And, and you always show up with a gift, a bottle of wine or some flowers, and, and you never bring anything because the host has worked very carefully to, to prepare all the different dishes and to the pair of the right wines. And when you get invited to someone's house, it's it's actually a great honor because it's quite private in many ways. And then I went back to the States, and, and the hospitality is very different there. They're a little more relaxed about it, and it's good in its own right, but and you always offer to bring something. Can I bring a drink or a dessert or a salad to take some of the weight off of your host as well? And so it's different in that respect. And then I, I got married, and I married, uh, my wife is Dutch, and we went to Holland, and I experienced Dutch hospitality, and Dutch hospitality is fantastic. Because you get to the person's house, and then they offer you a cup of tea, and then they offer you some biscuits, and then you have something cold to drink, and then they offer you some 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 cake, and then you have another cup of tea, and then you have something savory, like cheese and crackers, and, and then you have another, something else cold to drink, and then eventually you get to the main the main meal, and you eat that. But you're constantly eating and drinking, and they're offering you more, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful. And so this morning, what I want to do is, is dive a little deeper into this idea of hospitality, because over and above being a cultural phenomenon, hospitality is actually a biblical thing as well, as we saw last week. And it's really important for us as believers, as followers of Jesus. And it's important for us as a local church, because hospitality connects really, really closely with two of our core values. The first is this, that we want to be a sacrificially loving family. We want to love one another like family, and that costs us. It asks, we were forced to sacrifice in order to be able to love one another that way. And hospitality is all about treating people who aren't family as though they were family. And over time, well, they become more like family. It feels more like family. The second thing is that we want to be a mission-minded church. That, that what Jesus wants to do in, in, in the world, to see the gospel about Jesus go forth, we care deeply about that. We're always concerned about that. Who are the people who need to hear? Where are they? And how can we be a part of seeing them hear the gospel? Whether that's directly here in our own city of Wolverhampton, or whether that's further abroad in our country, in the world. And hospitality is one of the most basic ways that we do that. When you invite someone into your home, someone who doesn't know Jesus yet, and you allow them to see how you are with your, with your family, with your wife, with your husband, with your children, how you interact. Perhaps it's a prayer before a meal, as simple as that. In those intimate moments, you share Jesus with them. That's evangelism. And so that hospitality connects with that because we are mission-minded. And so this morning, I want to look at a key moment in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 23. I'm going to read it now. If you'd like to turn there on your phone or in, 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 a, in your Bible, if you have one with you, Luke chapter 22 and verses 14 through 23. Three. Luke writes this, And when the hour came, Jesus reclined at table, and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given them thank, given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood, 
But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. And so this morning, I want to delve into this topic of hospitality through looking at the institution of the Lord's Supper, that first moment when Jesus redefined the Passover meal. And through the lens of the Lord's Supper in Luke 22, we're going to look at three meals throughout Scripture. We're going to look at Passover back in Exodus chapter 12. We're going to look at the Lord's Supper right here in Luke 22. And then we're going to look just briefly at the future wedding feast of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 19. And through those three meals that we see laid out for us in the Bible, we're going to look at three ideas. First, that hospitality is prescribed. It's commanded. And that's based, that's rooted in who God is, his character. Hospitality is prescribed. But secondly, hospitality is practiced. It's modeled for us. And we see that in the life of Jesus in Luke 22. And thirdly, that hospitality is promised in the future. And we, our hope for the future is tied up in that. And so three Ps, I like my alliteration. And some of that is for my own good so I can remember my points as I go through. Hospitality is, now I've forgotten it already. Hospitality is prescribed. Hospitality is practiced. And hospitality is promised as well. And so Jesus, here in Luke chapter 22, he says in verse 15 to his disciples, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus earnestly desires to eat, to share this important festival, this important meal with his disciples. Why? Because the Passover is key to what he's about to do on the cross. And in order to understand that, we need to look at the Passover back in Exodus. And here's where we see that hospitality is prescribed on the basis of who God is and what he's done for the people of Israel. Back in Exodus chapter 12 is where we've had the Israelites are in the land of Egypt. They've been persecuted. They're not wanted there. They're enslaved. God is in the process of freeing them. And there's been nine nine plagues that have already happened. Nine plagues that have been judgments that have been enacted on the Egyptians and still Pharaoh is saying no. And so just before the 10th happens, the institution of the Passover is put into place. This very specific meal, it's a special meal. It's a lamb that's sacrificed and the blood is to be painted above the door of each house of the Hebrew families. And then they're to eat the meat of the lamb in a very specific way with the with specific herbs and, and specific preparation. And then they're, they're, they're meant to be dressed a certain way. They got to have their belts tightened and their bags ready. And they're ready to leave when God moves and they're trusting him that he is going to liberate them. And then in chapter 12 and verses 12 and 13, here's what God says to the people. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. And I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord, says the Lord. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so the truth here, the the, the blood that the Israelites need to put over their door lintels is is proof that they, in actual fact, are just as deserving of that judgment that the Egyptians are about to receive, the death of the firstborn and at each household, even amongst the animals. They're just as deserving of that judgment as the Egyptians are. And the proof is because they need that blood. They need something to to be substituted. Other blood has to be shed so that their blood is spared, so that their lives are spared. Because they too, like the Egyptians, are enemies with God because they're humans. They're separated from God in that sense. And so God has provided them a way so that he can treat them as not deserving of that punishment. He provides a substitute, the lamb that they sacrifice and they put the blood. And when the angel of death comes through, he sees the blood and passes over. 
and they trust what he says and they do it and they're spared. They're spared from death by the substitute blood of the Paschal Lamb. And so Passover became a regular thing every year. In fact, their calendar began with Passover. That's what God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 12 at the very beginning. He says, this is the first day of your new year. The first week of your new year is spent celebrating the Passover, how I liberated you from Egypt by sparing you from death. And they continue to remember it. And so while the people were in Egypt, God showed mercy. Hospitality is about food and board, but it's also about protection, shelter. And God shelters the people of Israel. He spares them from death while they're in the, in the, in the the land of Egypt. But more than this, he also adopts them as his own people. Several chapters later in Exodus chapter 19, after he's brought them up out of the land of Egypt, after they've come through the Red Sea, he says to Moses, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among the peoples. For all the earth is mine, says the Lord. The earth is mine, is mine. it belongs to me, and I'm going to share it with you. If you obey my commands and keep my covenant, and you shall be, the people of Israel shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, says God. And so he just doesn't spare them. He doesn't just spare them from death in the land of Egypt, but he also brings them out and gives them good things in addition that they do that they don't deserve. There is no reason why he special reason. There's nothing special about Israel that made God choose them as His holy nation, His His treasured possession amongst all the peoples. They'd done nothing. They were the least of all the peoples in a sense. They were former slaves. And God says, no, you are my treasured possession. He gives them good things that they don't deserve out of his world that belongs to him. And so we see the hospitality of God himself towards the people of Israel. And so he gives them commandments that are meant to set, set them apart, make them holy in regards to other nations. And hospitality is part of those commandments. And it's rooted in who God is. Hospitality is prescribed to the people of Israel. We see that really clearly in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 34. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 34. God says to the people, When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you. That's the definition of hospitality, treating the stranger as though they were a native, treating not family as though they are family. Treat him as the native native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And so, because Israel had experienced God's hospitality in the land of Egypt, he brings them out and he says, And now you also, steward, show hospitality to others as a result. Because You know what it was like in Egypt. That's the first reason that he says in Leviticus chapter 19. You know what it was like in Egypt. You were there. You were enslaved. They tried to exterminate you. You know what it's like. In Exodus chapter uh, 23, he says, you know the heart of the sojourner. You know the heart of the sojourner. And so have a heart of hospitality yourselves. A heart that is given, that desires to show hospitality. And then he closes with that that statement, because I am the Lord your God. It's a reference to Exodus chapter 20. It's the preface to the Ten Commandments. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and who freed you from slavery. And so hospitality, that hospitality is prescribed to Israel and it's based in, it's rooted in who God is. Our God is a hospitable God. He sh- everything belongs to him and he shares it with us. We were enemies, strangers to him and he welcomes us. He welcomed the Israelites into a new land flowing with milk and honey. Can I suggest to you this morning that hospitality is 
commanded for us as well in the New Testament. It was for the Israelites, and it's commanded for us because God is still the same God. He's the same yesterday and today and forevermore. It's, it's commanded in the New Testament in, in Romans chapter 12. It says, seek, pursue hospitality. But it's also, really interestingly, it's a qualification for elders of the church. If, if you don't show hospitality, you're not qualified to be an elder to men in the church. But it's also a qualification for widows in 1 Timothy chapter 5. It's the widows who want to be on, on the list of widows who are cared for by a local church. They need to practice hospitality as well. Can I suggest to you this morning that hospitality is actually a mark of godliness? The godly person, the person whose heart is, has been captured by God, who has experienced his blessing, his hospitality towards them, is hospitable in return as well towards others. It's a keystone habit in that sense. A keystone habit is the kind of habit that shapes everything else in your life. It accomplishes a lot of things in it. Hospitality is a mark of godliness. And so this morning, Christian, develop a heart for hospitality. It's the overflow of God's grace to you. It flows out towards others. If you have truly experienced that God is good, that should flow out of your life towards others as well. And so very practically, don't wait for an invitation. Sometimes we wait, expect others to invite us. Take the initiative. Take the initiative. There's different ways of doing it. There's different styles. Some people are more organized and, and and administ not administrative, they're more organized about it. Some people are more free going, and there's value in both, there's goodness in both. God has gifted all of us with his grace so that we can share that through hospitality with others. Right now it's, it's tough to have people in our homes. But offering to, to buy someone a coffee and, and share some time together, that's hospitality as well, even if it's in the center of town taking a walk in a park, having someone in your back garden. It's more work right now, but it's worth doing. It's worth doing because we have experienced God's hospitality towards us as well. And so if you're not regularly practicing hospitality, can I encourage you to, to do this? Make a list. Who are some people that you can, be, you can share hospitality, show hospitality to? Do you need to sit down and maybe you need to sit down and make a list of recipes that you could make that are easy, that you can put together and maybe that would help. Maybe you need to sit down with, if, if, if you're married, you sit down with your spouse or whoever else, if you share a flat with someone, sit down and say, hey, we need to, we need to show hospitality. Let's figure out one day a month, two days a month, every other Saturday, the third Thursday of every month, where we're going to commit to having people over. We're going to commit to having people over. And friends, when you start anything new, it's always awkward at first. Because relationships take time. When you welcome people who you don't know into your home and you treat them as family, it takes time to build those memories, those shared experiences together. And so one of the keys with hospitality is to do it regularly. Do it regularly. Commit to doing it regularly. And remember, hospitality is a two-way street. You bless someone by inviting them into your, into your space, your context, but you also bless when you are invited in and you go in and you take Jesus with you to that, pe to that person, to that household. Hospitality is prescribed in the Old Testament. Through the Passover, we see that rooted in God's character, who he is. Coming back to Luke chapter 22, we see that hospitality is not only prescribed, it's practiced, it's modeled for us by Jesus. Look at what he says in verse 19 through 21. Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. And then he took the cup, and he said, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus does something very surprising here is proof of the authority that he had. He redefines the Passover meal, not in terms of what God has done in the past, but what God is about to do in the present. The Passover now, the, bre the bread and the wine, all of a sudden is about him. He is the once for all Paschal sacrificial lamb. 
That's what John says in John 1, 29. says, behold the Lamb of God. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5. That's what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. He says, it talks about the precious blood of Christ. It was without sin. He's the pure, perfect, sacrificial lamb. Offered up in our place on our behalf. And so when we trust in him on what he did on the cross, we are spared from death, just like the Israelites trusted in what God had said about how they were to be saved. Put the blood above the doorpost. Eat the, eat the meal in this manner. Trust me. And they did it. They obeyed. And they were spared. We trust in what Jesus has done, and we too are spared from death. And like the Israelites, we're freed. We're no longer slaves to sin, says Paul in Romans 8, but we're, we've received a spirit of adoption, of sonship. And so here's the beauty. Here's how Jesus models God's hospitality to us. Now, says the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 10, we are welcomed into God's presence because of Jesus, and we can walk in confidently into his presence, not as one tiptoeing, you know, the only people who can come into my house in the middle of the night and wake me up are my kids. They come in and then, Daddy, I had a bad dream. Daddy, I need to go to the loo. That's what this picture is. We can come in confidently knowing that he will receive us. As one author said, the gospel comes with a house key. The gospel comes with a house key. You know who, have, who has house keys? Kids do. I have a house key to my parents' house. Kids have house keys. We are his children, and we can come in with confidence because of what Jesus did. He models, he practices God's hospitality towards us. And you notice that hospitality now, in a sense, is about sharing Jesus. You see, we share that meal, and Jesus says the meal represents his body and his blood. And so there's a wonderful sense in which when we get together, the measuring stick for, for, for biblical hospitality is, did we share Jesus? Did we share Jesus? We share a meal. We share time. We share our space, our homes. Perhaps we, we protect each other in different ways. But did we share Jesus? He's the measuring stick for true hospitality. Can I suggest to you this morning, by way of application, what Peter says in 1 Peter 4 and I, we looked at it last week, he says, show hospitality without grumbling. Because that's how Jesus modeled hospitality. He washed his disciples' feet. He served them. He did the dirty work. And it cost him. And he didn't grumble. He didn't grumble. He did it for the joy set before him. Show hospitality without grumbling. Sometimes we do it because we grumble. We want to grumble because it's inconvenient. It's costly. It costs us effort and time and money. It's not an easy thing to show hospitality. I, I can relate to that sometimes. I like my space. I, don't, I need to rest. It's costly. If that's you this morning, can I suggest to you that actually the way that we start to develop a heart of hospitality is actually by obedience. As we start to obey Jesus' call to hospitality, and we walk in that humble obedience, he starts to turn our hearts in that direction. He starts to work in us and through us, and our hearts warm to that, to, to that act of welcoming others into our space. Can I challenge you this morning, if you struggle with grumbling about hospitality, start by obedience. Start with obedience. Sometimes, though, we grumble because the privacy of our home is not only about rest and about privacy, but there's something, there's, our homes provide a cover for sin sometimes. We don't want people to come in because they're coming, they can see us as we really are. If that's you this morning, if there's a sense in which your home provides cover for sin that you're hiding away, secret sin, can I encourage you to deal with that before the Lord? Let him into that room. He wants to get to have access to every room in your spiritual house, as it were. He wants to bring light into that room and to deal with your sin with you. 
Friend, if you're joining us this morning and you're going, hospitality? Huh? What? Jesus modeled hospitality? The truth here is that we are separated from God. We're strangers to him. We have no part with him unless we trust in Jesus. And Jesus is the one, because of what he did, the Father welcomes us in. I encourage you to keep looking into Jesus this morning because that hospitality, that community, that sense of home that you're looking for is found in him. It's found in him. Hospitality is prescribed because of who God is. It's practiced, it's modeled for us in Jesus. And lastly, it's promised as well. Jesus says in Luke chapter 22 and verse uh, 16 and then verse 18 he says for I tell you I will not eat and it I will not eat it this meal until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God and then later in verse 18 he says for I tell you that from now on I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes until it comes Jesus references a future meal when we will experience the fullness of God's hospitality the fullness of fellowship and community together in heaven he's talking about the wedding feast of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 19. And here's what the Apostle John records for us. He heard voices crying out, Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. For the last several weeks, we've been looking at First Peter. And one of the overarching themes in 1 Peter is that we are sojourners and aliens during our time in this, um, in, on, this world, in, on this planet. We're spiritual exiles. Our home is not here. Our home is in heaven where Jesus is king. And so the future promise, and this is really tangible, is that we're going to be welcomed home to a wonderful feast. By a wonderful feast. The, a marriage feast. If you've ever been to wedding feasts, what a wonderful time. What a, a time of joy and love and hope. And that's how we'll be welcomed home by a wedding feast, the wedding of the Lamb and His bride, the church. And we look forward to that. That's why in 1 Peter 4, 8, he says, the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. That's what we're looking forward to. Don't forget that future hope. And in the meantime, show one another hospitality. And so we encourage one another now as believers by showing hospitality to one another. And it's a foretaste of that fulfilled, full-on hospitality that we will experience and benefit from in the future together with Jesus. But we, benefit, we do that now in a partial way. And so if you're saying, I know we have future hope, but how do we experience eternal life now? How do we experience that hope now? It's through hospitality. It's when we gather together as believers and we share Christ together. One of the easiest ways that we do that is when you gather with a fellow believer, pray for one another. Pray for one another. Before you, before you leave, if you hear something that needs prayed for, hey, can we pray for that? Hey, how can I pray for you right now before we go? Pray for one another. That's, we're welcoming each other. We're, we're experiencing that, that sense of heaven right now, eternal life now, pray for one another when you gather together. That's biblical hospitality. But we not only share hospitality with that future, that future perspective, that eternal perspective with other believers, we do it with those who don't know Jesus yet as well, because we know that longing for home that they have. We know that longing for home, that sense of rootlessness, that sense of where do I belong? And we found that belonging. And so when we gather, when we invite and welcome in those who don't know Jesus yet, we share our homes, we share our food, we share protection, shelter, but we also share Jesus because we know that that's the ultimate need that they have, that we all have. We welcome strangers, those who are not like us, those who aren't family, into our homes as though they were. I want to close with this point. One of the easiest ways to start welcoming people in 
and sharing Jesus and to show hospitality, have fellowship with other believers and to have that sense of, uh, of evangelism, outreach, sharing Jesus with those who don't know him yet is by inviting people over who are from different places. See, you invite a friend or a colleague who doesn't know Jesus yet and you invite them over. And at the same time, you invite a friend from church over and you connect people together. And it's really practical, but it's a really good way of getting people connected into the gospel, in contact with other believers. In contact with other believers. Friend, if you've been listening along and, and, and you're saying, man, hospitality, community, I need something like that. We would love to have you partake in that, to be part of our local church, of our local fellowship. And the way to do that is through Jesus. There's a wonderful picture in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. And Jesus is pictured standing at the door and knocking. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and eat with him and he with me. Friend, Jesus is standing at the door of your heart this morning. And he's knocking. And he's saying, friend. I've got everything you need. I can satisfy every desire, whatever that is, if it's for community, if it's for security, if it's for joy, if it's for peace, if it's for meaning and purpose, whatever those deep-rooted needs are, Jesus is standing at the door and saying, friend, let me in. I wanna show you the hospitality of the Father where he can meet not just the physical needs, but the soul needs as well.